I'm Annalie Newitz. I'm the tech culture editor at Ars Technica. And tonight, we are incredibly lucky to have Lee Cheng here from LA, um, who is the chief legal officer at Newegg and is also kind of a culture hero to a lot of people, especially small businesses that have had to fight against patent trolls. And you've had a really long and interesting history with patent trolls, I know, and especially this particular case that you got involved with where a company, Sovereign, claimed that they owned online shopping cart technology. So why don't you tell us about that and how you got involved with that? Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, I, I uh, joined Newegg almost 11 years ago. Next, I joined as a corporate lawyer. Uh, and that was my background for most uh, the first half of my legal career. I did everything in my power to stay out of the courtroom. I had no desire to ever try cases, to litigate. I knew very little about uh, patent law. I knew very little about litigation. So imagine my surprise when I joined Newegg and a lawsuit landed on my desk. Someone claimed to own the online shopping cart. And they wanted millions and millions of dollars from us. And I looked at it and I said, this can't be for real. This cannot be for real. And they said, oh, yes, it is for real. We just got $40 million from Amazon. We got a bunch of money from Gap. And I talked to some uh, big name lawyers at big law firms with offices in fancy glass towers. And they said, oh, yeah, this is a real patent. It's been around since 1994. It was invented by guys from MIT. You know, you need to pay up. You need and I said, this is just absurd. And I took a step back and I looked at it and I said, oh, my God. You know, if we pay these guys off, we could get sued by dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of people. And sure enough, in short order, we actually had claims asserted against us by four different companies asserting patents that covered some aspect of online search. And I realized we would never hear the end of it. If you pay off a terrorist, you only encourage terrorism. If you pay off a kidnapper, you will have more people kidnapped. So uh, I also looked at the overall marketplace. You know, Newegg is not a small company. Uh, back in 2005 when I joined, we had just crossed the billion dollar sales threshold, which is, you know, big, which is really a very nice thing. But, uh, and we started getting some public attention. And unfortunately, that started to attract some negative attention from people who wanted a piece of our success. And that included frivolous litigants. And I realized that we were number two in the online, in the e-commerce marketplace, pure play. Anybody who was going to go after Amazon was going to come after us. Amazon's much bigger. They have a lot more money, higher margins. We could not afford to pay what Amazon paid. So we had to really design our own path and find a different alternate path to follow in this area, or we would be put out of business sh you know, shortly enough, because we would then end up having to raise our prices to all of our, our you know, wonderful customers. And we didn't want to do that. So uh, for, you know, I also looked at the patents. You know, I had somebody look at the patents. I looked at what the Supreme Court was doing even back in 2005 and at the higher levels of the judiciary. And it seemed like even back then they were starting to understand, my God, you know, this is a very bad trend. If we have a chance to address it, we're going to try to stop it. But judicial reform takes a long time. It takes people willing to fight and bring the cases up to the federal circuit and to the Supreme Court. But overall, the trend lines look good at the high level. If someone was willing to fight through the uh, uh, pit of uh, plaintiff, the, the, the plaintiff heaven known as Eastern District of Texas, you would win. <laughs> you would probably win on appeal, but very, very few people were willing to do that, partially because, well, you know, people don't like taking risk. In-house lawyers like myself, you know, typically the av typical in-house in counsel goes in-house mm -hmm. because they want to go home at six o'clock every day and they don't want to take risk, and they throw the, you know, the, uh, the matters over the fence to outside counsel, so they don't want to take risks, they don't take anything to trial. Close to what, some, somewhere between 95 and 98% of all cases settle before trial. And then secondly, you know, I think they were really afraid of an adverse verdict or adverse judgment in the Eastern District of Texas where even to this day, more than 40% of patent cases are being filed. The majority of them are bullshit, right? But I took a look at it and I said, I think we can design a strategy. It'll take a couple of years. It'll involve a little bit of risk. But at the end of the process, we will not be sued anymore. And, and we will help achieve something that is very, very dear to the people who found it, Newegg, which is to do something good, not just for the, we're not, you know, we're a privately held business. But 
um, we're not just about making money. We're, we took a lot of pride in doing well by our customers. We took a lot. We take a lot of pride in trying to deliver some value to society. So uh, I presented a, a strategy and a plan to our management team and our founder, and, and I, I also looked at the numbers in a little bit in a different way because a typical patent troll pitch was, hey, you know how much money it's going to cost you to fight a case, two to six million dollars to ca take a case all the way through trial. We're only asking for three million dollars or two million dollars. Give us the money and we'll go away. You'll save money. It's good for you. I looked at it a little bit differently, which was, hey, wait, if I can control legal costs and spend by using boutique law firms, by doing as much work myself and wi with my team as possible, if I can control the cost, this is a cost that's spread out over three to five years. That's how long litigation takes. There's time value to money. If I write a two and a half million to three million dollar check right now, it's worth a lot more than two and a half to three million dollars. It's worth more than six million dollars in three to five years. I just I had a math. quick question about um, just going back to the patent itself. When you looked at the claim when they said we own the online shopping cart, what what is it about that that made you think this is just crap? This is obviously patent trolling. Like, what was it about that patent that just stood out to you as this can't be a you know legitimate claim? It's a shopping cart. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's a shopping cart. It, 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 I used one that week. Is it because it's obvious? Is no, that no, and, and the other, so the, they asserted three patents. Sovereign asserted three patents. One of them was the equivalent to a cash register. One of them was the equivalent to a shopping cart. And I forgot what the other piece of bullshit was. But, you know, <laughs> you know it, was just, it was just, you know, very obvious stuff. Even to someone who was a patent law neophyte. And it, it in, in we, we had also then patents asserted against us where someone assert, you know, had a patent claiming that they owned drop-down menus, right? <laughs> and then some aspect of search. And then, you know, in, in er, every, so everyone, all of these guys were saying, without our patent, you couldn't have succeeded. And I was just thinking, wait, I, I was actually alive in the 90s when all these e-commerce companies popped up and there are millions and millions of websites and they are all dead, Newegg suc succeeded, and it's not because we had a shopping cart, right? It's not because we had a drop-down menu. And so, you know, I overall, it was very, very obvious that there was a big scam going on and that, uh, you know, people were, were, someone needed to say no, someone needed to take a stand. We weren't the first. So uh, I, I really can't take credit for being the first to say no and take a case to the Supreme Court. There were real, a lot of great companies that we, fo we followed in the footsteps of. It used to be that if somebody was granted a valid patent and at trial they w the patent was held to be valid, it was very easy to get an injunction against the business of that company. That's the reason why BlackBerry paid NTP $620 million on a patent that subsequently was found to be invalid. They were afraid to be shut down. I probably honestly would not have um, been, you know, been willing to fight as hard if, for example, eBay hadn't taken Merck Exchange all the way to the Supreme Court and removed the threat of an injunction so that if someone was willing to roll the dice and absorb you know, a bad judgment in East, Te East Texas. I, I have never gone to trial. I have never planned for a case filed in East Texas to win the case. I don't <laughs> think you can, you know, we have actually won a case in East Texas. Um, I, that was a surprise. We celebrated very hard. Coincidentally, <laughs> coincidentally, that was the night we won that case. That was the night Tyler, Texas had a debutante ball. That was amazing. <laughs> you know. So um, I don't quite know how to interpret that. Yeah. yeah. So so uh, you know, y y y you basically plan for the case to go all the way through appeal. We budgeted it all the way through appeal, and after a couple of cases, we took three all the way through trial. We've been sued 35 times. You know, people stopped suing us. Um, probably around 2012, 2013, the message started getting around. So can you talk a little bit about the process? You've mentioned the Eastern District of Texas, um, and I'm, my understanding is that, there's, there, that the vast majority of patent trolling cases are filed there. Can you talk a little bit about why that venue, out of all the courts in all, in all of the land, why is that place, Marshall, Texas, this tiny town in Eastern Texas, why is that the place to bring patent trolling cases? So, so, so Eastern District as a district, um, it captures about 40, it has a quote unquote 40% share, 40% plus share. Marshall, Texas itself, one courtroom that's probably about three to three and a half hours away from Dallas gets more than 20, I think it's 20 to 25% of all patent cases filed in the United States. 
and um, there are at least, last time I looked, it, there were 600 federal judges in the United States, and one courtroom gets more than 25, it's something like 25% of all the filings. This is not an accident, right? So there is speculation um, about why this happened. There, there have been articles written about, you know, uh, concerns expressed about the depressed East Texas economy back at the turn of the millennium, right? And federal judges, certain federal judges, uh, certain retired federal judges, uh, basically viewing themselves as the stewards slash godfathers of the local economy because oil was depressed at the time and thinking how can we help stimulate the economy. Um, but that's speculation, you know? Uh, there's, there, there's no videotaped evidence of this, okay? But the numbers kind of speak for themselves, right? They adopted certain local rules. So judges have a lot of discretion. Uh, federal judges have a huge amount of discretion. First of all, also federal judges are appointed for life. So short of an act of Congress, impeachment, they cannot be removed, very hard. And judges have a lot of discretion setting rules in their court, so they created certain rules that heavily, heavily favored plaintiffs in these cases. Mm -hmm. You know, um, rules like discovery rules where you had to turn over, quote, unquote, everything relevant. What the heck does that mean, right? It completely disfavors defendants because these plaintiffs are shell companies, right? They're, they're bullshit shell companies, often with nothing but a mail drop. There are, there are actually some really cool videos if you guys want to see them uh, on YouTube right now. In these videos, I, there's a guy named Austin Meyer who was sued by a patent troll. He's kind of rich and he's... He's really, you know, it has a lot of piss and vinegar, and he went and made some videos about like these 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 shell companies and empty offices that these trolls, you know, set up in in East Texas to file these cases, and these judges never grant they almost never grant stays, you know, they never do anything that can help control and decrease costs for defendants. Defendants actually are real businesses, and we have a lot of documents and records that we have to produce, you know, that could be relevant in these cases. So it, the costs just really run up. And so it makes the trolls' business pitch very appealing. Um, gee, you know, we just want a discount. You know, we just want a certain amount that's a discount to how much you would spend defending yourself. So you know, give it to us and we'll go away. So by the time you get to an actual courtroom in front of a judge, you're facing off with this lawyer, for example, from Sovereign, and you know, you've said that like you when when you saw the the patent and the challenge that was that was filed against Newegg, you felt like that was pretty BS. And you, you know, but then you had to stand in the same courtroom with this guy or, or a team of lawyers, presumably from, from Sovereign. So can you talk about what, what is it like to sort of face off like that between people who you know are essentially kind of faking it? Well, you know, you, you basically have to look the jury right in the eye. And, y you know, there's one very, w there are some wonderful things that uh, I, I think resulted from, uh, you know, positive things, not wonderful, nothing wonderful positive things, <laughs> non-negative things that happened because <laughs> we, we, we were sued. I, I did get to go to East Texas quite a bit in Texas, and you know what? Southern hospitality really isn't a myth. Small town Texas, good people, really, really good people. They, do the they do want to do the right thing. The people in the jury pool, they wanted to do the right thing. Um, barbecue's really good, um, <laughs> very, very good, and, and fried pies. And so, um, <laughs> Hmm, what else? Uh, so no. So you, so you know, you get in front of these juries, and you know, it, and it's very interesting how plaintiffs try to do th what, what they try to do. It was very obvious, right? When you talk to jury consultants, and then when you went to do like mock juries, and when you t you know, to, wh where you brought in people from the community who who essentially pretended they they were jurors, it's very very. And then when we actually went through jury selection itself, it was very obvious that the plaintiffs always wanted to kick out as many people who were technically astute as possible. If someone was an engineer, out of here. If someone you know, was a computer scientist or you know, knew their way around computers, they would try to get them excluded from the juries. And you know, it was because anybody, they, I think they, they realized that anybody who, who understood technology would know that these patents were a, a load of crock, right? And, um, and also, it, uh, it doesn't happen very much anymore, but they, <laughs> They really did, frankly, like to play race cards. You know, Cisco did, I, I've heard Cisco, the, the people have done mock juries there, and, but we, we looked at, we experienced that ourselves. You know, when in our second trial, we had a local counsel get in front of a 24-member jury pool, and uh, we were d a defendant, a remaining defendant, Overstock and Amazon and Sears, and the plaintiff's counsel, who was a guy who pitched us, 
he knew our company. He knew where we were based. He knew we were an American company. He gets up in front of, and his name's Mike Jones of Potter and Mitten, and he's an asshole. And I'm very vindictive, and I call out names. You know, and the plaintiff's counsel gets up in front of the jury pool, and he says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you know, Amazon and, you know, Sears are well-known companies, but this next defendant, Newegg, y'all have never heard of them because they are a Chinese company. Well, fuck you, right? <laughs> you know, fuck you, Mike Jones of Potterman, right? <laughs> you know, so we objected, and I was the corporate representative, and we weren't going to hide from that issue. We are proudly American, right? Because in this great country, people from anywhere around the world can be American, right? <laughs> and I looked the jury, <laughs> I looked the jury right in the eye, the members of the jury right in the eye, every one of them slowly, and I said, I told them, we're based in California. Our revenue is almost all from America. Our profits are all made in America. We proudly employ, you know, over a thousand Americans, right? And this is a country where anybody from anywhere could be American, and they got it. And that was the one trial that we won, <laughs> <laughs> right? That was the one trial where, you know, it was bu it was also kind of nice because um, our our some two of our co-defendants, Amazon and Sears. Uh, on Tuesday morning, they settled. Their lawyer who was supposed to do our opening, he's a very, very famous trial lawyer in Texas named Tom Melsheimer, he insisted on taking the lead role, right, because he was Tom Melsheimer. Tom Melsheimer, remember that name. <laughs> so he insisted on taking that role. He said, my clients aren't settling. I deserve this role because I'm Tom Melsheimer. 8.30 in the frickin' morning on Tuesday morning when trial's supposed to begin, he goes up in front of the judge and says, my clients have settled, turns around and walks the hell out of the courtroom. Didn't leave us with any notes, an outline. So our counsel had to whip together an opening argument that was 45 minutes long in 30 minutes, which is a, which is a testament to the ability of a good lawyer to bullshit. Right? <laughs> and he did a spectacularly good job. You know, and um, so, so, but that trial, so Amazon, Sears, they settled the case. I don't know exactly what they paid, but my understanding was something like, I think it was like eight figures, right? Healthy amount. Friday afternoon, we got a full defense verdict. We invalidated a patent that we were told that Alcatel-Lucent had used to extract several hundred million dollars in licensing fees from companies big and small across the United States. And so we got a full defense verdict. It was invalidated, we didn't have to pay a cent. And, um, it and then we went to the debutante party, right? <laughs> so what, I mean, You've talked about a lot of these big companies who went up against the patent trolls and wound up settling. Um, and this happened a lot in kind of the early aughts or mid aughts that a bunch of companies just would rather settle. So why was it, I mean, you guys were willing to, you know, um, to fight, um, but why were so many companies unwilling to? You mentioned before um, that they could get, there would be the injunctive relief um, threat. But what were some of the other threats that these companies were worried about? Why were they just so willing to fold instead of stand up to these trolls? It really depends on, so being a public company, it matters. It is a rare public company that uh, I think is not, so everybody says they're managed strategically, they're managed for the long term. You know, matching actions to words is very, very rare. It's the rare public company that truly is managed for the long term benefit of their shareholders. It's usually companies where like, I think founders are still in charge and they have a controlling stake. Maybe it's Google, maybe it's Amazon. Those are companies that can do stuff, Facebook, that can do stuff like that, right? But most public companies, they're managed to the quarter, right? And they're always afraid of an unforeseen large litigation loss. They would rather, and they would, they are almost always willing to take, or, or they prefer to take paths of least resistance and lowest possible risk. And um, to get ahead in life, this has been my, my own experience in my, my own, my own um, belief. If you want to get ahead in life and you want to do uh, achieve more than um, what the what you know what everybody else achieves, you've got to take a little bit of risk. This is what Silicon Valley, what the tech industry is all about, right? And lawyers don't take risks. You know, lawyers go to law school mostly because they're freaking risk adverse and they didn't know what else to do, because they're reasonably intelligent people and they want to earn a good living and they go to law school, and most of them actually, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of my classmates from law school no longer practice law. They're not fulfilled humans, right? But they're really, really risk adverse. The only profession more risk adverse are accountants, 
right? But that's another story. After my third drink, so um, <laughs> my brother, my brother is an accountant. So, so, uh, so uh, I mean, yeah. As Annalie was saying, a lot of these uh, patent cases happened in kind of the aughts, uh, you know, 2010 area, and then I think Congress and there's been some effort, you know, on the Hill to sort of try to rein that in a little bit. And I think a lot of people. Like us, probably a lot of people in this room, there was a, there was a piece on This American Life. They did a great job t explaining patent trolls to people and why they should care and why they're just weird and interesting and terrible. Um, you know, Congress did pass, or the, the American Invents Act went into effect in 2014. Uh, we had the Alice decision at the Supreme Court. Um, can you talk a little bit about the effect kind of at the, you know, 30,000 foot scale and the national scale? What does patent trolling look like after those kind of landmark things? Has it diminished? I mean, you guys, I, it seems, have gotten less because you fought back. But, you know, Ars Technica this week, I think Joe Mullen himself wrote two patent trolling stories. I think one of them was today. Um, so it seems to me that they're still continuing. So I'd, I'd love to hear from you as one who has slain the beast. Uh, you know, do these, do, th do these laws matter? These laws do matter. Everything that, uh, every law that has gotten passed, Reform Act that's gotten passed, every single judicial decision that's been won, it, it, it helps move the needle a little bit. But I think it would be a mistake to assume that we could declare victory after any particular uh, legislative victory. Although comprehensive patent reform, just very candidly, I think it's a lost cause. It's not gonna happen because uh, we have a very, very focused lobby both in terms of, b because their, their, their livelihoods, financial, huge multi-billion dollar, cent -a billion, you know, billion dollar financial interests are behind preserving the status quo. It's not just the trolls and plaintiff's lawyers, it's also industries like big pharma. It's also even now increasingly technology companies that are starting to realize like, gosh, um, we, 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 we can't innovate, we're shit anymore, okay? <laughs> You know, and, and we have some patents that we paid a huge amount of money for, and, you know, we want to preserve the status quo, and, um, you know, we, 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 it, it, would, it would behoove us to not be too aggressive in trying to help small and medium-sized companies be entrepreneurial by freeing them from the risk of frivolous patent litigation, right? So comprehensive patent reform. I mean, you're going to get pharma fighting it tooth and nail. Pharma is the single biggest lobby, you know, to Congress. And so we have been trying to, you know, and I've been saying this for a couple of years, and I think, you know, there are some folks who are trying to get something called the Venue Act passed. Nothing's going to get passed this year, okay? Well, let, that's been accepted as a given. It's an election year. But we're trying to, you know, and the reason why I, I suggested focusing on venue reform is because of freaking East Texas, <laughs> okay? You know, the abuses visited upon defendants. There is really no rational reason why 40 plus percent of patent cases are filed in four courtrooms, in more than 25 in one courtroom. Judge Rodney Gilstrap's courtroom in East Texas. There's no reason for that. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry. There is a very good reason for that, okay? But there's no good reason for that. You know, and if uh, they pass local rules that make it, and, and, and they issue decisions that make it very hard to get venue transfers that you can get in most other courthouses in the United States. The Venue Act will make it easier for people who have no strong ties to East Texas to get out of those courtrooms. And if you can just curtail filings in that one place, one venue, right, you can eliminate a lot of abuse. And that's the legislative focus. So, so patent, patent, patent reform, um, it's gonna be a long battle. Patent abuse, it's actually just a manifestation of something much, much bigger in uh, American, you know, the American legal system. It's only one manifestation of litigation abuse. We have a legal system that heavily, heavily favors filing shitty lawsuits, okay? <laughs> it, it, people who do that pay almost no negative consequence. It's very hard. We, don't ha we, we have a system that some people call the American system, and it, it, you know, unlike most of the world, the loser doesn't pay. It's very hard to get a fee shift here, and as long as we have that system, and we will uh, probably always have that system because most of Congress, you know, there are lawyers. Most legislators are lawyers, right? You know, and, and lawyers contribute a lot of money every year. We, it, it, th things like patent, patent abuse will occur. We can, the best we can do is basically tamp it down 
to a nuisance level, right? We're kind of getting there right now. We're moving in that direction right now. So patent abuse is absolutely still happening. The filings dropped temporarily in 2015 in the wake of Alice, right? I think, you know, it didn't drop a huge amount, but it dropped. But um, I have on good authority because I've actually become pretty friendly with a couple of patent trolls. Like, you know, you start talking to people when they're sitting next to you for a whole week, <laughs> you know? And I have it on good authority that they're planning to jump back into the fray. There's good money to be made. And there's two types of patent That's cases. That's terrible. Yeah, I, I'm really curious <laughs> to know, like, now, because Saris was mentioning, you know, there has been efforts to reform, both, you know, in Congress and the courts. And so what does today's patent troll look like? You know, what, what are these, what's the next phase in patent trollery? Is it going to be just like what we were seeing before with online shopping carts, but some other kind of preposterous invention? Or is, are there new tactics? Like if, what, what do you think is the next, you know, what, what do we need to be worried about if I start a small business? Or, you know, what do I need to be looking for? Um, so, so they're going in two directions right now, right? So th basically, you can th if you think of patent abuse as an industry and trolling as an industry, the mid-market's been wiped out by you know, proven efforts to fight um, trolls. So they basically bifurcated into filing two types of cases. One is what we call the big game hunting cases where they're going after Google and Apple and Amazon for large amounts of money and they're in, Huawei, in large international companies. International companies often settle, especially in East Texas. And, <laughs> and you know, the risk of losing is so high that they're often willing to pay eight figures, maybe nine, to, to eliminate that risk, right? And then on the other side, there's the nuisance trolls where they are filing dozens, sometimes hundreds and hundreds of lawsuits. And they're asking for very, very little from every single defendant. And these are the ones that are the most pernicious because they target small and medium-sized companies. Is this like the like the personal audio? This is the, the troll this that claimed to... This is the shipping and transit, the arrival star guy. But it's like like the personal audio is like the one that claimed to own the patent on podcasting and yeah. they were suing that's podcasters. Right. That's right. So that's an example of that? Y you know, but the other... Um, so, so on the one hand, yes, there are still a lot of bad patents being asserted. And the strategy of the trolls there is they basically ask for relatively little, right? 25, 50, 75, $100,000. And collectively, though, when they're suing dozens and hundreds of companies, I mean, that amount of money just usually isn't enough to fight for, for most companies to, to think that they, they, can, they can really fight over. So especially small and medium-sized companies, they don't have the budgets, right? What I've discovered, of course, is that we don't have to spend all that much to wipe one of these guys out. You just sort of organize everybody. You make a little bit of an effort to organize, get all the defendants together to say, hey, you know, look, if everybody's going to cut them a twenty-five to fifty to seventy-five thousand dollar check, right? Like, why don't you just cough up half of it into a stinking defense war chest <laughs> and wipe them out? But it's it's harder to do than you think because someone has to make those fifty phone calls or twenty-five phone calls. And then the instinct of most in-house counsel or people when they get one of these suits is to pick up the phone and call their outside lawyers who charge hundreds of dollars an hour right, to deal with these cases. They never want to lose a client. They never want to lose a fee. And once it goes to an outside counsel, it's all over. It's, there's going to be a settlement. You know, what in-house in lawyers, uh, we, you, you basically have to have an organizing force to get defendants to collaborate and work So is together. that what you would advise people to do is if they get hit with one of these, try to find other defendants? Is Absolutely. Is there some place that they can go to look? Are there online forums? Are there? Um, can they, they call, call you? you? <laughs> well, well, you know, some call people, Lee. Some people call. Some people have called me, right? And it's actually very, very easy. So, so here's an unintended, ironic consequence of America Invents, right? There's a section called Section 299 that was put into place uh, by some well-meaning person, uh, people to, you know, they they thought it was uh, Section 299 basically said, okay, trolls. Uh, can't fi sue everybody all at once. They basically have to sue, er you know, p file individual lawsuits, right? And what, <laughs> what that ironically ended up doing was, it used to be that when trolls sued everybody at once, all the code, all the code defendants were listed on one complaint. So it, it, before AIA passed, people were actually starting to realize, hey, you know, I just go down that list and call everybody, da -da 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 -da, right? And then after Section 299 passed, you know, you ended up getting sued <laughs> one comp one person at a time. Yeah. And it actually ended up fragmenting the defense for so a period of time, right? And I actually wrote an article about this, uh, a, a, um, a, you know, and, and it's taken a while before people have started to do something as simple as look up who else got sued, 
right? You know, <laughs> and, and it's it's a little distressing, but that's kind of what happens, you know. And and that's and and when the trolls are so when the trolls are suing a startup company, and it, it, when the startup companies call me, I have to honestly tell them, right? I, I don't think you should take this to Matt. It's going to bankrupt you, right? If they're asking for twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars. You know, uh, you, you, what you should do is really just shoot for the very best settlement that you can. But what I tell them is find some friends. Look everybody el else up. Try to organize a joint defense group. Try to get inside the troll's decision curve. And then try to gun for, and, and, and if, even if you settle, settle hard. Make sure that, you know, you convey that you're going to be a hard target. If this troll ever comes after you again, you're going to fight even harder. And the startups that, um, have followed that advice. You know, I, I, I have a very good friend who works at a st small company, and he joined a joint defense group that we organized, and he paid about a fifth what he usually paid, right? So you can do that. Y so even if people need to settle, settle hard. That's what I would advise them. Find friends. Find people to share costs with. Get as much information and data as you possibly can, right? Trolls do not want a fight. You know, every t they, they have a certain ROI, in mind, they, they would, their best outcome comes when people sign quick checks. Never sign a quick check, right? And, and that's what I'd, I would advise small, medium-sized companies. For larger companies, for anybody who is facing the threat of repetitive suits, right, you really need to start thinking about adopting a strategic response to this type of litigation. That's why we did it, because we knew we would be serially sued and serially asserted. And if we didn't adopt a strategic response, and we just followed the same playbook everybody else had, at best, we would get the same results against better funded, larger companies. We would be at a relative competitive disadvantage. So I, I, what I basically did was to try to use our legal function to create a competitive advantage for Newegg. We had to do it, or else we would have, you know, been screwed. <laughs> um, let's take some questions from the audience. The question was, are, are business method patents more intrinsically bullshit than other patents? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and software patents are too. I mean, I, I don't think software should be patentable. We have a perfectly good IP, uh, you know, set of IP laws and copyrights, <laughs> you know, and, and the, the reason I, I say this is because, you know, that, that, that can protect software. And, you know, and, and, and the reason, the practical reason I say this is because there's so many different ways to code for the same functionality. Uh, you know, and, and the example I would give is, is for example, like you know, that we faced ourselves is the search functionality, right? We were hit with four different claims asserting some aspect of search, right? And there are God knows how many dozens, if not hundreds, of patents out there covering some aspect of search, and. You know, if, even if you license one uh, one of the patents, if, if you it, w it was very it became very obvious if we paid off one of those jackasses, we would have to pay them all off. You know, the same amount, which is why we paid none of them off. You know, and and that's why you know that's that's I think a, a w one of the reasons why software shouldn't be in general patentable. So the patentability of software and business methods was not something that is built into was built into the Patent Act. It was created by judges. You know, and the Supreme Court had a beautiful opportunity in the Bilski case to flush the State Street president down the toilet. There was just so much lobbying done. So, so right now, I think the horse has left the stable in terms of making business methods and software unpatentable subject matter because there are so many very, very large software companies now um, who have gotten in-house counsel advice to file you know, billions and billions of dollars worth of software patents that um, we're just never going to be able to get enough support, lobbying support, to to eliminate those those subject areas as patentable subject matter. Um, but yes, they are bullshit. Has anyone tried to fight the good fight, gone to appeals, lost, and and, like ruined, the and ruined the company? Has that went out of business? Has that ever happened? I can't think of one. I, I actually can't think of one. I can think of companies that have lost a lot of money. Uh, Microsoft dropped a Supreme Court decision to the tune of four hundred million dollars or something like that. Huge amount of money to I four I I I I four, whatever something like that, you know. And I four I, uh, actually, um, I think they were represented by Ted Cruz. 
hiss. You know, um, but uh, but you know, it, 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 unfortunately, it's kind of Microsoft, right? And um, Microsoft just they just didn't they they fought a lot of good fights. You know, the the in-house lawyers at Microsoft they're they're very good folks. They were they were you know they were fighting a lot of these fights before like before I jumped in in, in, in into the fray, and um, they just don't get a good shake in most courts because they are Microsoft. And um, so they lost a, a fairly, they, they basically had a very, very large judgment sustained, but um, because it's Microsoft, they were not put out of business, <laughs> you know, and um, we're just all paying for it right now, so. What do you think of the free and liquid patent market, the ability of companies to buy and sell patents, is this part of the patent trolling problem? Is that right? That was well okay. paraphrased, yes. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, I, I think to the extent that there are valuable patents. There's nothing wrong with, um, you know, treating them like any other asset, right? I, I am not anti-patent. Um, I do believe in intellectual property. Newegg sells, you know, tens of thousands of products every single day that wouldn't exist but for, uh, you know, s you know, intellectual property protection for the vendors for patents that add real value to the lives of consumers and society. I think that until there's an ability to really create you know, meaningful quality standards for patents and patentability, right? Um, they're, they're the assumptions made about the value of a piece of paper that essentially you know, sets forth an idea that trans is translated into, into legalese, right? And, and, de and declares that every such piece of paper has value, right? Th that's very problematical to me. We, we grant, as you know, our US PTO, despite all of the wonderful reforms and efforts by Michelle Lee, a very good friend of mine, to um, improve patent quality, we grant far too many patents every year. 300,000 patents got granted last year, right? M if I remember correctly, something like 80% of all filed patents eventually get granted, right? And most of these will never be used in a product or service that is useful to society. The Patent Act was not passed, right, to give windfalls to somebody who could put into legalese some brain fart, okay? <laughs> it wasn't. The Wait, isn't brain fart a business method? Well, you know, <laughs> I, I'll, 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 I'll ask Eric Spangenberg, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it wasn't. It was the Patent Act's real purpose was to benefit, ultimate purpose is to benefit society. And, and the USPTO, foundationally is in the examiners are heavily they've always been they continue to be heavily incentivized to grant they're heavily incentivized they're, they have incentives f to produce right you can't I, I don't think they I, I would seriously doubt that production means that you reject patents at the USPTO there's this mythology this very romantic mythology that patents represent all patents represent innovation from this little dude in a garage like Thomas Edison who comes up with this brilliant freaking idea that can help the universe it, it, it's not that's not the case the vast majority of patents are pretty useless to society and you know the average amount of time that is spent on a patent at the by USPTO examiner is 10 hours, okay? And considering what's at stake, right, which is, you know, property that belongs to all of humanity, right? You know, that could, could be used to make products and services if disseminated properly that could benefit everybody, right? What's at stake, you know, 10 and a half hours is just really not enough time. And especially when you have examiners who are heavily incentivized to just <laughs> stamp yes, right? Yeah, it, 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 it's um, the free and liquid market right now. It is part of the problem because patents suck. <laughs> Most patents are bad. Can you talk about the post-grant review, the inter partis review, uh, and maybe just summarize for those non-lawyers in the room who do no, don't know their Latin phraseology uh, and how that's working? Am I understanding that right? Yeah, so I it's helpful. All of these measures are helpful. So post-grant reviews are, op are opportunities to challenge the validity of bad patents. And um, there are a, a couple of different types of post-grant reviews. They have different levels of efficacy. Unfortunately, they're very expensive still. It's better than challenging a bad patent in court, right? 
getting a bat an in, in invalidity ruling can cost at least hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, to go all the way through trial and appeal. Um, these post grant, these administrative reviews, uh, there are some that can cost as little as fifty thousand dollars. They're called ex parte. Um, reviews where someone just says, you know, I found some prior art, you know, I, you know, here's why that patent's not valid, and you can file, but it's not an adverse. That's not a really adversarial process. So if the USPTO basically just says, uh, you know, we're not gonna, you know, in, in, you know, institute the the review and goodbye, you're just kind of screwed, right? And then um, there's the inter partes review, which is an adversarial. It means that the parties essentially can can can. Someone can file a challenge to the validity of a patent, and then the troll can fight back. Patent holder, I'm sorry, the patent holder can fight back. <laughs> and not all patent holders are trolls, really. I mean, I'll, you know, so I'll, I'll go into my definition of what a troll is, right? An abuser is. And um, the patent holder can fight back, and then the U.S. you know administrative law judge can rule a certain way. And then there's an ability to go kind of back and forth, and it's kind of adversarial. And the probability of success in an IPR is much higher. There's a sort of a subset of IPR called the CBM for covered business method that only applies to financially oriented patents. But um, you know, it all costs a lot. So the IPR, very helpful. CBM, very helpful. But it costs two to three hundred grand on average to get one of these filed and to go through the process. Who's going to do that? Who's going to file an IPR and I, you know, CBM unless you have to? So when people get sued, sometimes large companies are willing to do that, right? It doesn't really help small guys very much unless they all decide to band together to give the, the bully a kick in the testicles, right? <laughs> you know, it, that, that's what or has to happen. Or other body parts. People have to work together. <laughs> you know, defendants have to work together, if, you know, and, and defendants have to tell their outside counsel, you know, uh, cut it out. I want you. I instruct you to work with other outside counsel, and we need to pull our resources, maybe just hire one outside counsel to represent the whole defense group kind of thing. But the IPRs are helpful. It doesn't end the problem, not even close. What will US patent litigation look like in 20 years? Go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I actually think patent abuse, uh, so patent abuse, again, it's just the latest in, you know, uh, you know, it's the latest wave of abusive litigation. We had securities class actions, we had mass torts, all sorts of sh stuff that's been, you know, it, it's, it's a manifestation of a deep-rooted problem in our legal system that incentivizes and creates no negative consequences for suing, right? And so um, this wave of abusive litigation is particularly pernicious because it can affect innovation. It can affect entrepreneurship. It can keep... So people, people who are at established companies right now that um, are, are, are asserting monopolies are, are, are really just milking existing monopolies. And I won't name them, but we all know who they are. Qualcomm. So, um, <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, but like, like I, I've, I've been in debates with people from Qualcomm who, who just, they are the biggest donor to the lobbying effort against patent reform. The single biggest donor, bigger than any pharma company. Okay? And... You know, they'll, they, they, I've heard their, their rep make the statement like, well, you know, our patent system is the reason why the American economy, you know, is, is so great. We have so much innovation. No, 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 no. Facebook and Uber and Apple and Microsoft and even Qualcomm, they all succeeded not because they filed a shitload of patents, but because they executed against great ideas and they made, they made great products and services that benefited people that customers adopted and were willing to pay money for, right? If we had had, you know, aggressive assertions of bullshit patents, broad bullshit patents that hit startups systematically, would we have had a Facebook? Could we have had a Microsoft, right? Could we have had, you know, an, an, an Apple, right? If Xerox had asserted their patents, right? Could we, <laughs> could we have had an Apple, you know? And the answer is freaking no. Right? So 20 years from now, if the Repu so one of the reasons I made my bet to take the cases that Newegg faced through trial and appeal was because I was betting on the Republic to survive, right? Long term. America, for America to survive and for us to have an innovation economy, the Supreme Court had to go a certain way. The Federal Circuit had to go a certain way. 
Federal Circuit's not as enlightened as the Supreme Court. <laughs> but they had to go a certain way, and they were going a certain way, at, even as of 2005. At the higher levels of the judiciary, they were, they were doing the right thing. You know? And so 20 years from now, I think patent abuse will be tamped down to where securities class action is and a lot of other waves of abusive litigation are, which is at a nuisance level. Bigger picture for everybody to think about, right, is okay, we're now tamping down this wave of abusive litigation, but they're all stacking up one on top of the other. And at a certain point in time, you know, will we still have a country that can do? You know, are we a country that can build another Golden Gate Bridge? Are we a country that can build a high speed rail system between San Francisco and uh, Los Angeles? <laughs> Or are the lawyers going to basically kill everything, right? <laughs> are the regulators going to kill everything, you know? And, you know, I, I go to China a lot. When China, so, so okay, there are problems in China, okay, granted. But, like, when they want to build a freaking, one or two, a, a freaking, you know, rail system in a city, it takes two years. When we want to build a light rail system from downtown Los Angeles to Santa Monica, it takes five years to do an $80 million environmental impact survey. I honestly don't give a shit about a little frog in a pond. I just don't. I'm sorry, the real legitimate reason? What's the legitimate reason for forum shopping, forum shopping in, in the Eastern District of Texas? Because in Europe, you're required to, sh to file the suit in the forum, in the venue of the defendant. So why is the US system like that that allows for and venue shopping in East Texas? Yeah. Connection is very tenuous, right? And the, and, and the loophole is really, the, the philosophical reason behind the loophole is kind of righteous, right? You want to grant trial court judges discretion because they're on the ground, they're close to the facts, they're close to the parties, and you want to grant them enough discretion to make good decisions, right? So they get to make rules, local rules. They get, to, they get a lot of deference. So there are standards for review even on appeal. They get a lot of deference on a lot of decision making, right? So... Um, Historically, they've gotten a lot, of, a lot of deference on deciding which cases can stay and go. The, the whether somebody has enough of a nexus to be bound to a certain venue, right? You know, it, 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 there's common sense, and then there are legal, you know, standards, and then there's what a, a court can decide. And it's just a fact that East Texas historically didn't grant venue transfer. When we first started getting sued in East Texas, right, our outside counsel systematically told us, don't bother to challenge venue. You'll never get it you know, granted. And by the way, you'll piss off the judge. <laughs> so, you know what? Judges aren't gods. You know, at the end of the day, I realized after you know, a while, judges aren't gods. You know, um, most of them are good humans, right? Uh, most of them want to do the right thing. Most of them think that they're doing the right thing. Some of them think they're gods. But, um, <laughs> you know, you know and, and, and they would tell us, don't, don't, don't do this. And then the problem with that kind of thinking is that if you know something's wrong and you don't challenge it because nobody else is challenging it, then what's wrong is going to perpetuate forever, right? So thank God Volkswagen challenged it and took it up to the Fifth Circuit. Thank God a number of other companies eventually challenged you know, um, I, I those laws. So judicially, technically, the standards have changed. But East Texas continues to deny venue transfer at a relatively high rate, right? East Texas continues to not grant fee shifts despite, you know, changes in legislation that, grant f that, that say that fee shifts should be awarded more often. You know, th as at this point, like, the, the so after um, AIA in 2014, Right, the number of fee shifts um, granted increased something like 50% across the country. Right, East Texas, for several years, granted which, zero. Right, and after a little bit of pressure, we, we started to make sure that all of our filings to the federal circuit contain statistics. Uh, East Texas has granted no fee shifts. East Texas granted no fee shifts. East Texas granted one fee shift. <laughs> judge Gilstrap granted one e shift. One very. He's a very very clever judge. He's very well aware of the bad publicity that East Texas and he, you know, that and he's getting. So he granted a fee shift in one of the most egregious cases, right, EDECO. 
And at one, in one fell swoop, he wiped out a hundred. He, he basically not just wiped, not only wiped out 168 cases, right, that had been filed, you know, in in his courtroom by this, you know, ho horrible, horrible troll. He also granted a fee shift in that case. Now, whether that any of those fees are collectible is another story, right? Because these are shell companies. But I think he did it for PR purposes, right? And um, you, you know, and, and it also begs the question of, uh, excuse me, why were why did he le let 168 cases sit in his courtroom for so long? <laughs> but <laughs> but you know, open questions, right? But I forgot your question. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good place to end. Um, thanks very much for coming out much. to another Ars Technica Live. Yeah. This is Lee Chang, Slayer of Patent Trolls.